Thanks for listening to the award-winning PRS Journal Club podcast. I'm happy to present your hosts, Drs. Casey Kraft, Min Jung Cho, and Ara Salabian. This is for you. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the January 2020 edition of the PRS Journal Club podcast. This is the first Journal Club with the new 2020 resident ambassadors. I'm Min Jung Cho, PRS resident ambassador from UT Southwestern, and I'm joined by my co-ambassador Ara Salabian from the NYU Plastic Surgery Program and Casey Kraft from the OSU Plastic Surgery Program. I want to thank the 2019 resident ambassadors, Lily Mundy, Raj Parekh, and Kyle Sanyak for their phenomenal job over the past year. Today, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Alex Wong for our discussion. Dr. Wong is an Associate Professor of Surgery at the Keck School of Medicine at USC, Director of Basic Translational and Clinical Research, and as well as Director of Microsurgery Fellowship and Medical Student Education in the Division of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. So thank you, Dr. Wong, for joining us for this Press Journal Club podcast. Thank you, Min Jung. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. The article we will be discussing is Free Fibula Flap for Restoration of Spinal Stability After Oncologic Vertebrodectomy is Predictive of Bony Union by Dr. Merkley at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. As a quick reminder, this article along with all of the articles that are discussed in this podcast can be read for free on prsjournal.com, including an archive of all the past Journal Club articles. Achieving a spinal stability after an unblocked resection of a spinal malignancy is challenging due to the extent and the location of the defect. In general, unblocked resection of a spinal malignancy requires a single or multi-level vertebratomy, which compromises the integrity of the spine. Currently, the standard care for restoring a spinal stability after an unblocked resection includes posterior titanium instrumentation, anterior spinal column reconstruction, using an interbody alloplastic cage, and non-vascularized particular bone graft. Previous studies of a non-vascularized spinal bone grafts greater than 4 cm showed up to a 50% non-union rate, which results in a spinal instability, instrumentation complications, and graft resorption. In the study out of the MD Anderson Cancer Center, the authors used free frivola flap for spinal reconstruction, and they discussed their experience in this paper. Briefly, the authors retrospectively reviewed patients who underwent vertebratomy for a primary tum- bone tumor from 2002 to 2017. The authors divide patients into two groups, those who received vertebral reconstructions utilizing alloplastic instrumentation and non-vascularized bone grafts only, and those whose spinal reconstruction consisted of alloplastic instrumentation, non-vascularized bone graft, and free fibula flap. The patient who had free fibula flap underwent two stages of surgery. The first stage was performed in the prone position, and posterior vertebral elements were resected, and posterior spinal instrumentation and non-vascularized bone grafts were placed. The second stage was performed in the lateral decubitus position about two to four days later after the first stage. The anterior components of the vertebral bodies were resected, and free fibula flap was placed. Then, the overall outcomes of the bony fusions were assessed and compared between the two groups. Between 2002 and 2017, there were 23 patients in the control group and 16 patients in the free fibula flap group. The patient characteristics include tobacco use, preoperative, postoperative radiation therapy, new adjuvant chemotherapy, and medical comorbidities were similar between the two groups. The median number of the vertebrae resected in the free fibula group was 2, compared to 1 in the cage group. Despite the smaller mean resection size, there were significantly more non-unions, instrumentation complications, delayed bony union, and neurological complications in the control group. The non-union rate was 41.7% in the control group, while it was 6.3% in the free fibula group, and also instrumentation complication rate was 333 in the control group and 6.3% in the fibula group. Furthermore, a control reconstruction was significantly predictive of non-union. I thought this was a great paper. While there are many studies using free fibula for head and neck and lower extremity reconstructions, there are very limited studies on its use on spinal reconstruction, and also what would be the best inset for the fibula flap in these cases. By using a single fibula strut combined with adjacent alloplastic inner body cage, the authors have shown that stable bony union can be facilitated and achieved. 
And also the most important aspect of this paper in my mind was achieving spine stability in young patients who otherwise have no other medical morbidity. By staging the procedures, the authors have decreased anesthesia time per procedure, and they also forego with the flap monitoring due to the morbidity and location of the flap, which also could add to the time as well. With these interventions, authors allowed otherwise healthy patients to continue on with their lives with a shorter period of waiting for the bony union than the standard of care. So with that, I would like to ask Dr. Wang, what was your main takeaway from this study? This is a very challenging reconstructive situation, and it's rare. If you look at what the authors are presenting from a high volume referral center, they looked at a 15 year period from 2002 to 2017, and really were only studying 40 patients. So this is a rare problem that probably happens at only a few high volume referral centers. But I think that the information they provided was that adding a vascularized fibula is safe and actually has a lot of advantages in preventing bony non-union, which is certainly a problem in this reconstruction. And I think that's great evidence to add. In fact, it's useful because at our institution, we do a few of these, certainly not as many as I think are done at MD Anderson where the authors are based out of. We do more management of metastatic lesions and most of the patients are sicker. They have a few more morbidities, prior radiation, chemotherapy, and most of the time our spinal surgeons think that the surgery is already intense enough. As indicated in this paper, they require both posterior and anterior approaches, sometimes are two-day procedures. Usually they don't actually ask us to do such a complex microvascular bone flap, knowing that it would add four, six, or maybe eight hours to the surgery. So in general, they feel that that additional harvest is not good for their patients. So in, in our series, we don't tend to do that much of this. But I think that the data that's provided by the authors is compelling. Um, in particular, if we look at figure three, where they do a Kaplan-Meier style curve of the bony union, um, it's pretty compelling. Uh, there's no doubt that adding the prefibula has a huge effect on bony union, and that for sure is going to be advantageous to the uh, patient. So complex set of patients, difficult surgery, but certainly uh, pretty clear in my mind that if you can do it, adding vascularized bone is going to help. And of course, that's in line with most other reconstructive problems. Vascularized tissue is always going to most likely give you the best outcome if you can add it. Anything you do to shortcut that is likely to have an inferior result. So in your experience, how would you say how often are you asked to do a spinal reconstruction, either anterior or posterior column? And what type of reconstruction do you usually perform? At our institution, the spine surgeons do their own instrumentation, both posterior and anterior. Our involvement is soft tissue, generally paraspinous flaps, or if not those, some sort of rotational muscle flap for spine coverage. So personally, I believe among most of my partners, the bony portion is not taken on by us. Okay. And then do you think it's because at USC you don't do as much as unblock resection as Amy Anderson because of that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and literally after reading this, I reached out to the main cancer spine surgeon that we work with to present this data and ask him why he didn't recruit us to offer more vascularized bone. It goes back to the morbidity that they feel that unless it's a previously irradiated site, they feel comfortable with their existing algorithms of both posterior instrumentation, anterior cage, and then bone grafting. And do you have a specific size of bony defect that you would perform a non-vascularized or vascularized? In general, four to six centimeters, I think, is the critical size. And I think that's in agreement with what the authors choose for their indications. And then you would use fibula for vascularized, and what would you use for non-vascularized? Yeah, fibula for vascularized, and iliac crest is a good source for a non-vascularized, and it all depends on the precise defect, but those would be my two go-to areas. Well, thank you, Dr. Wong, and I would like to ask my co-ambassadors a question. So, Casey, how often do you see spinal reconstruction perform at your own institutions? I would have to pretty much echo what Dr. Wong just said. At Ohio State, we're generally involved for soft tissue reconstruction, either paraspinous muscle flaps or some sort of rotational muscle flap for coverage of the hardware. But 
to my knowledge, we've never done a vascularized bone graft for spinal reconstruction at our institution. I haven't spoken to any of the neurosurgeons personally, but I would imagine that it would be sort of the same feeling that Dr. Wong mentioned with just adding morbidity to the case. These patients generally are sick beforehand and there's a lot of blood loss if there's multiple metastases that they're trying to enucleate and in general prolonging the case even longer would be something that they would try to avoid, I think. So I don't have any personal experience with vascularized bony reconstruction for the spine. How about you, Ara? I'm pretty much in the same boat here. I think as Dr. Wong was saying, these are extremely rare cases. And I don't think, I mean, I've only been here for a few years, but we've had any that we've really been involved in. One area that we have been useful in with our oncologic orthopedic colleagues is more in the pelvis, things such as large osteosarcomas or chondrosarcomas of the ilium. We have started more and more to try and bring in vascularized bone, and this has really been an effort of one of our faculty with another orthopedic oncologic surgeon and having interest on both sides, and it's more with just CAD CAM planning, preoperative 3D planning, having custom jigs, and then using a press fit fibula if needed to stabilize mainly the sciatic buttress there. However, in most cases, even if we are doing the cases with them and helping them, and they are doing 3D planning, and the fibula isn't, or the vascularized bone really isn't needed, and if it is adding, as had been mentioned before by Casey and Dr. Wong, that much time, they don't really I think particularly enjoy that aspect, but definitely if it is a hostile environment, if it is going to be a very large gap that they don't think they're going to get union with just bone grafting, um, where there's going to be even higher morbidity without vascularized bone, they do bring us in. But it's really been in the setting more of pelvic resections, as well as femur and lower extremity cases, um, but nothing really with the spine. Yeah, same here. I, I would agree with Dr. Wong and Ara and Casey as well. We are really not involved in the spinal reconstruction at UT Southwestern either. Only time we will be called to help with this when, whenever there's a hardware exposed after the procedure, just like uh, everyone said, like cover the soft tissue with the paraspinous flaps or any latissimus flap or anything like that. But I think I agree with everyone, this is very rare. But however, the results have been really good with a significant higher bony rate, about 11 folds higher than the control group. So with that, I think we'll end our discussion of this article. Be sure to tune in for the other two articles that we'll be discussing on this month's podcast, as well as the PRS Journal Club podcast. They're broadcasted every month. Don't forget to also participate in our monthly PRS Journal Club on Facebook, where you're able to interact directly with this month's selected articles authors. Finally, I would really like to thank Dr. Wong for joining us this podcast, and thank you very much. Thank you, Minjong. Thank you for listening to the award-winning PRS Journal Club podcast. Be sure you read all the articles being discussed and some classic pairings from the archives on prsjournal.com.